Dead America, El Paso, Part 3. Dead America, The Second Week, Book 8. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 11. Detective Roger sat in silence, peeling the curtain back slightly so he could peek outside without being seen. Two large black SUVs pulled into the parking lot, one hauling a large trailer. Leon strolled out to meet them with a confident swagger. Don't worry, detective. I have a good feeling about our new friend there, Ethel said quietly as she set a mug of piping hot coffee on the desk beside Rogers. He sighed and nodded before taking a sip. Thanks, Ethel. He offered a smile to the 70-something woman with the kind eyes, hiding his grimace at his burning mouth. I'm not worried about Leon. I know he can handle himself. I'm just worried about what the cartel is going to throw at us next. She gave his shoulder a gentle squeeze and a reassuring pat. When you need more coffee, you holler, okay? Thank you, he replied with a nod and peeked through the slit between the curtain and the window frame again. A small army of cartel members hopped out of the SUVs in seemingly pre-rehearsed unison. Leon put out his hands, palms out. Settle down there, boys, he said, noting the amount of fingers on the triggers of their AK-47s. Y'all are bringing us supplies today. Why would anybody here try anything? One of the guards spat out a string of Spanish, and Leon narrowed his eyes. He stalked forward until he was nose to nose with the cartel member, who stared up at him in surprise. He leaned down, and in perfect, quiet Spanish said, if you're going to insult someone in secret, make sure they can't understand you. Not everybody is going to be as friendly about it as I am. He patted the guy on the cheek, and he jumped back, flushed and scowling. Get that trailer unhitched now, Rodriguez bellowed from the SUV and stepped out to size up Leon. The military officer wanted to smile when he spotted the second-ranked man in the whole cartel and their secret mole. But at the sight of Angel, the sleazy son of the cartel leader, Leon steeled his expression so as not to give anything away. One day someone is going to teach you a lesson, Angel sneered. Leon rolled his eyes. Well, I'm sure that day will come. I can guarantee it's not going to be from a daddy's boy like you. Angel growled and lowered his chin, looking ready for a fight. But Rodriguez took a step forward, putting himself between the two men. Leon, you have a busy day ahead of you, he said. The boss was very pleased about your last find for him, and he's very excited to see what you come up with next. Because his generosity comes at a price, Angel smacked the side of the trailer. And there's a lot of generosity in here. Leon bit his tongue, crossing his arms. He was used to his large, dark frame intimidating people, but these cartel dicks were something else. He followed Rodriguez around to the back of the trailer, and his eyes nearly bugged out of his head at the sight of guns, ammo, fuel canisters, even a few motorcycles. Holy shit, Leon breathed. Rodriguez inclined his head to the stash. They should get your group back up and running after your losses yesterday. We did lose more than just equipment, you know, Leon reminded him. Angel scoffed. I made sure to put a couple of candles in there you can light in their honor. Right now, Tiago doesn't feel comfortable providing you with men, Rodriguez said quickly before things could escalate. He views this detail as a suicide mission and doesn't want to waste manpower that can be put to better use in town. So we're expendable, huh? Leon raised an eyebrow. That takes me back. Rodriguez sighed. Hopefully the guns and ammo in here will help you stave off death for another day. There are two dozen semi-automatic rifles and about 3,000 rounds of ammunition. The dark-skinned officer let out a low whistle. Well, that will almost clear the town out. I will work to get you more. However, you can make my job easier by finding things to appease Tiago. Rodriguez shot him a knowing gaze. Leon took a deep breath. How long until we have to provide another offering? I'll be back this time tomorrow, Angel declared. Tomorrow? Leon exclaimed. It's going to take us longer than that to even clear the town, let alone go through it. Angel sneered, leaning in to bare his teeth. Then I suggest you take some chances, 
he hissed. Because while you may be off limits, there is nothing stopping me from making you watch, as I cut one of the residents here from ear to fucking ear. So unless you want a show, I suggest you do as you're told. Leon's eyes flashed with anger, his blood boiling. But he took a step back, knowing lashing out wouldn't get them anywhere. The slimy kid grinned smugly and headed back to the passenger side of his SUV. The guards followed suit, disappearing into the vehicle. Give our mutual friend my best, Rodriguez said quietly, his back turned to his comrades. And my apologies for, you know. Leon gave an imperceptible nod. We all appreciate what you're doing for us. We won't let you down. They shook hands and parted ways, the two SUVs pulling out and leaving the jam-packed trailer behind. Rogers appeared as the vehicles disappeared in the dust, holding out a styrofoam cup of coffee. How bad is it? He asked. Leon pursed his lips. We have 24 hours to find something. Nothing like making it easy on us, huh? Rogers asked, shaking his head. His companion took a sip of coffee and recoiled at how hot it was. Well, the good news is, I think this coffee will still be hot when they come back tomorrow. Yeah, Ethel has the coffee set on flesh searing today. The detective agreed. Leon shrugged as he blew on the steaming brew. Could be worse, we could be out. You know that level of optimism is going to grow old pretty quick, don't you? Rogers accused. Leon grinned. Only if we do. They shared a chuckle and toasted their face-melting cups of coffee. We've got 15 minutes before the scouts are due, Roger said as he looked at his watch. Want to go check on the night guards with me, or do you need to get set up? Nah, I was up early today, Leon replied. The satellite passed over just after dawn, so I got us a plan. Given our bullshit timetable, we're going to have to improvise a bit, however. The detective let out a deep sigh. Welcome to life in the zombie apocalypse. He led the way towards the bridge over the drainage ditch that separated them from the command center. They at least bring us some fun goodies? Yeah, we got a couple of midlife crisis mobiles and enough guns and ammo to take out most of the horde here in town, Leon replied. Rogers nodded thoughtfully. Most, huh? Well, we're better off than we were yesterday. Not sure what you're talking about, but I started my morning yesterday living the bachelor life. Leon smiled slyly. Now I'm stuck in a cartel-themed Groundhog Day, where we get to risk life and limb in order to get a Mexican drug cartel leader shit-faced. The detective shook his head. Bet that space never showed up on your what's gonna happen to me this year bingo card. Neither was hanging out with a one-eared wise ass, yet here I am. Leon extended his thumb and poked himself in the chest, and the two men shared a dark chuckle. Harry and Charlie stood guard clutching makeshift broom handle spears. They looked very focused, staring into town with tired, haggard faces. Rogers clucked his tongue. What do you say, boys? He asked. Harry startled, and they laughed when they realized who had been walking up behind them. Morning, detective. Little jumpy today, aren't you? Leon asked, as the man playfully clutched his chest. Can you blame him with all the cartel stuff last night? Charlie piped up. The dark-skinned man shook his head. Can't say that I do. Y'all have a busy night? Rogers asked. Had a couple of stragglers early on, but it's been quiet after that, Harry said. Charlie's eyes lit up with hope. I'm starting to think there ain't that many of them hiding back there. There's more than a handful out there, boys, so you keep watch, Leon warned. He hadn't shared his satellite imagery knowledge with the general folks, not wanting to scare them but they had a feeling that he knew what he was talking about. You boys keep up the good work, Rogers declared. Next shift should be in shortly, so y'all get some good rest. Charlie nodded. Thank you, we will, detective. The duo turned to head off, but Harry put out a hand. Hey, detective. What's that? Rogers asked. We were real sorry to hear about Jay and Malcolm. The older man lowered his gaze. Can you please pass our thoughts and prayers on to their families? We weren't really sure who their families are, but we didn't want to bother them in their time of grief. I'll take care of it, Harry, the detective promised. They'll be touched by the gesture. The two guards nodded and turned back towards the town, 
standing straight with their spears. You all right, Raj? Leon asked once they were out of earshot. The detective startled. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Just got caught thinking. Be careful, don't want to overheat that brain of yours, Leon joked, hoping to diffuse the tension. It didn't work, and Roger shook his head. No, it's just, I'm not even sure if they had any family that was left alive, at least here in town. Outside of Trenton and Reed, I don't even think anybody else knew them at all. I mean, I sure didn't, or not well at any rate. I just knew them as scouts who could get shit done. Hell, I feel a little guilty about my first reaction to their deaths being, where the fuck am I going to find another scout? You don't have anything to feel guilty about, Rogers, Leon insisted, tugging on the detective's arm to stop him. Truth is, we're at war right now, and shit needs to get done. You know, my uncle was in Vietnam. When I enlisted, he finally opened up to me about his time there. Not sure if it was to scare me about the colossal fuck-up I just committed, or if it was to get my head straight for what I was about to face. Regardless, he shared a lot of stories about his time in the field. But something he told me hit me hard, and it resonates with what you're feeling. He told me that when he was in the rank and file, he would spend each night mourning the death of people in his squad, kept a diary with him, and would jot down his memories of each man who fell in battle. I guess it was his way of keeping their spirit alive, Shortly after he started his third tour, his CO bit it in a nightclub bombing, so my uncle got promoted. A week later, two of the best mine detectors in his unit fucked up while marking a minefield. My uncle took out his notebook and started to write their names, but after staring at it for a few moments, he put it down and started looking over the rest of his unit to figure out who was best suited to take over their spot. He didn't have time to mourn, because if he didn't find their replacements quickly, more lives would be lost. That's where you're at right now. You don't have the luxury to mourn. You have to focus on replacing their skills, or else more people will lose their lives. So don't you ever feel guilty about thinking that again. Roger stared at him for a time, letting the words sink in. Thank you, friend, he finally said. I needed that. Anytime, Rog, Leon replied and offered a smile. He clapped him on the shoulder and started walking again. Now come on, we gotta go figure out how we're getting out of this one. Chapter Two Detective Rogers led Leon into the command center to find three twenty-somethings hanging around his desk drinking coffee. Trenton and Reed looked like they were fresh from a fraternity that would make a young lady guard her beer. Clara, the young lady with them, was fit and determined looking enough that she wouldn't be duped by such things. Morning, boss, Trenton greeted, muscles rippling beneath his polo shirt as he leaned against the desk. What kind of shit show you have for us today? Roger smiled at Ethel as she brought two cups of coffee for him and Leon, and then set his down to cool this time. Do you really want to know? He asked the younger man. Probably not, but I'm up this early, so might as well do something with the day. Trenton admitted. Oh, you gonna do something all right, Leon replied, and sat down at his desk. He powered on the monitor as everyone gathered around the flickering screen. When it settled, it showed a satellite view of Fabens. So to catch you all up, we had a visit from our unfriendly neighbors this morning, with a demand to come up with something today to satisfy their boss, Rogers began. Leon rolled his eyes. Yeah, apparently El Guabo enjoys his highs. Does this mean we're headed back to Van Horn? Reed asked, crossing his arms. Wouldn't be much of a point, Clara replied. I took the only top shelf stuff they had in the store. We need to go someplace new. Trenton shook his head. Problem is the only two places within range are Fort Davis and Fort Stockton. The former of which isn't big enough to have high dollar stuff. And the latter of which, however, might be worth a look. Nah, we need to stay as far away from Fort Stockton as humanly possible, Leon countered. Reed's brow furrowed. Why, it's the size of Fabens. He pointed to it on the screen. I mean, it's a risk, but it's doable if we're careful. Pre-apocalypse, it may have been the size of Fabens, Leon explained. But one of the last things I heard before abandoning my official duties was that the National Guard leaders in Odessa and Midland were telling civilians to get out of town while they could, and that Fort Stockton was safe. 
Only the dumbass didn't think to warn them that anybody with Atai blood was already infected. He pursed his lips and paused. Didn't take long for it to turn into a bloodbath. Based on what I could tell off the satellite, there may be 30, 40,000 of those fuckers there. Trenton's eyes widened. Fucking hell, man. I mean, we're good, but come on. That's why, in my professional opinion, our best bet is going to be here in Fabens, Leon concluded. Trenton ran a hand through his sandy hair. We thought about that, but our resident Ethel here said there weren't any liquor stores in town. It's no good. Leon punched a few keys and zoomed in on Fabens, focusing on the western edge of town. This is the local hospital, he said as he brought it right up close to a two-story building surrounded by a few hundred zombies. I propose we venture in there and get some of the high-grade pharmaceuticals and deliver as an offering. Some of those opioids will get you good and fucked up, which may be enough for El Guapo to grant us a few more days before next delivery. Reed sighed. Guess it would be too much to hope for him to overdose on them, right? Well, I'd prefer to put a round through his head from a thousand yards, Leon admitted. I wouldn't complain about that happening. Trenton raised his hand. Not meaning to dim y'all's hopes or nothing, but there seems to be a small army of zombies standing between us and the hospital entrance. Do we even have enough bullets to cut them down? Yeah, Leon began to zoom out. So here's the thing about that. Y'all aren't going to be able to do too much gunplay. He moved over to two schools that shared a sports field. There was a veritable sea of ghouls surrounding the two giant buildings. Remind me to tell the guards to stay extra quiet on duty, Rogers breathed. Clara stared at the screen and rubbed her forehead. It looks like thousands of them. Best guess is around 4,000, Leon confirmed. Maybe five. Hard to tell, really, but it's certainly enough to overwhelm any defense we could muster, and especially overwhelm any raiding party. Reed squinted and leaned forward. What the hell is holding them there? He asked. Not like them to congregate without a reason. Could be survivors in the school, Clara suggested. He laced his fingers behind his head, letting out a low whistle. If there are, shouldn't we be figuring out a way to get them out of there? First things first, we have to satisfy the cartel before worrying about anything else, Rogers corrected. Trenton threw his hands up. How in the hell are we taking out a few hundred of these things without firing a shot? Leon swiveled in his chair. Hey, Ethel, can I borrow you for a minute, sweetie? Do you need a refill, hon? The older woman asked. He grabbed his mug and checked it, taking the last swig. Really just need your expertise, but I won't turn down another cup. She grabbed the pot and headed over as he zoomed in on a row of metal buildings down the street from the hospital. Ethel, you've lived here for quite a while, haven't you? Leon asked, rolling his chair back a bit so she could see. She poured his cup and then set the pot aside. 35 long years and counting. That is a long time, he agreed. But I'm hoping your longevity can help us out. You see those buildings here that are just down the road from the hospital? Do you know what's there? Oh, ain't nothing there anymore, she replied. Not since 98. Used to be some sort of manufacturing place, but it went under when the owner figured out he could get stuff cheaper in China. Needless to say, that greedy bastard got run out of town real quick. Leon raised an eyebrow. So there's nothing in there now? Not unless you count a couple of dirty mattresses some rail riding bums would use from time to time. Ethel shrugged. Thank you, darling. You're the best, Leon said, and gave her a wink. She squeezed his shoulder before taking the pot and heading off to make a fresh one. So what? Trenton asked. You want us to Pied Piper their asses into one of these buildings? Leon folded his arms across his chest and reclined his chair, turning to look at the group. Best I can come up with on short notice, but I'm open to ideas. What are we supposed to do with them once we have them in there? Clara asked. He pointed to the gas station a few blocks away from the vacant buildings. We get them in, lock them up, then have us a gasoline-fueled barbecue. Well, I've heard worse ideas, Trenton said. Clara blinked at him. Really? Let's just say some of my frat brothers weren't going to make it to old age, even without the zombies he explained. She shook her head. Fair enough. 
Well, I think between the five of us, we can pull this off, Trenton said, holding up a fist to accentuate his point. Four of us, because Leon isn't going in, Rogers declared. The man in question's eyes widened. The hell I'm not. Y'all need me. Without a doubt, but this settlement needs you more, Rogers shot back. The four of us are expendable, because you can do anything we can do. However, you can do something none of us can. He pointed to the computer. There's just no replacing you. Leon chewed on his lip and leaned back in his chair. After a tense moment, he sighed. I'm still gonna help, though. He turned and zoomed back out, showing all of Fabens on the screen. If any of the school horde breaks off and heads your way, they're gonna have to cross this street. He pointed to the main road leading into town that had the barricades set up. I have a clear line of sight all the way down it. If a straggler comes across, I can take him out. If more than that comes, I can give you a warning. Rogers grinned. Always fun to know what impending doom is headed our way. There's a reason my nickname ain't Sunshine, Leon added. Trenton waved his hands in front of his face. Okay, four people versus a town full of the living dead, and we can't fire a shot. This is gonna be fun. Three people versus a town full of the living dead, Leon corrected. Trenton groaned. You're killing me, man. If we don't deliver, then the cartel is going to be doing the killing, Leon reminded him as he clicked around on the keyboard again. So we need to hedge our bets. I found this while doing a regional sweep, completely by accident. I was typing in the Fort Stockton coordinates and hit the wrong number, and this came up. He zoomed in on a small speck, about 20 miles east of the town, revealing four small buildings and a large trailer. Reed's brow furrowed. So there's a truck. Yep, a truck where it doesn't belong, Leon pointed out. My guess is that some truck driver decided to hijack his own haul, found this little abandoned place, and decided to call it home. The younger man shook his head. Dude, for all we know, it could have been there for years. This truck has been well-maintained, and recently, Leon replied, zooming in as far as he could on the pristine-looking vehicle. Hell, you can even see some of the remnants of the tracks in the dirt. This is somebody who decided to take refuge away from everybody else. So your plan is to go rob him? Rogers asked. Leon shook his head. I was thinking of a peace offering. Maybe bring them one of the rifles and some ammo to trade. Or use on them if they aren't hospitable, Trenton added. Rogers clenched his jaw. Let's try to limit that if we can. We already got enough enemies to deal with. Or maybe we will get lucky and they've already bit the big one, Reed said. Clara scoffed. What about the last two weeks makes you think we have that kind of luck? Uh, we're due, Reed tried. Leon swiveled to face the group again. Question is, who is gonna go? I'll take care of it, Clara said immediately, raising her hand. No, no, Reed cut in. Let me go handle it. She glared at him. You don't think I can? I didn't say that, he replied, putting up his hands, palms out. It's just that I don't think you should be out there on your own, that's all. Why, because I'm a girl and can't handle myself? Her voice rose a few notches as she turned to him, eyes blazing. Did you forget that I was on my own in Van Horn yesterday? Did you forget that I found my way through the city and located what we needed? All while I was by my lonesome and while I was a girl. There was a pregnant pause, and Reed turned to Leon. So, how was Clara getting there? Chapter Three Leon flipped through a few papers lying on his desk and motioned for the group to follow him. He opened the door to one of the trailers from the cartel, revealing the motorcycles. Trenton and Reed both gave little whoops and rushed inside, each wheeling one out. Rogers grabbed a brochure dangling from the handle of one of the bikes and flipped through it. Thank you for your purchase of the yada yada yada, he muttered. Okay, here we go. Comes equipped with two 12 by 18 by 10 storage bins. Perfect for a change of clothes, a picnic lunch, or an extra tank of gas. Blah, blah. This is the most fuel-efficient bike on the market and can get upwards of 400 miles on a single tank of gas. Is that going to get me where I need to go? Clara asked. Leon nodded. Oh, without a doubt. 
I think it's about 250 miles each way, including the detour around Fort Stockton. Detour, huh? Clara raised an eyebrow. What are the odds it's paved? Leon held out a map and ran his finger along a highlighted path and some written directions scrawled across the top. When you get to Van Horn, you're gonna want to take Highway 90 South. It's basically a loop that will run into Fort Stockton. You're gonna want to turn off here and keep riding until you come up on Highway 285. Head north until you hit this path, and you should come up on the east side of Fort Stockton. She took the map and studied it for a moment, then pointed to Marfa, Texas, which had been circled in blue pen. What's up with Marfa here? You sending her to see the Marfa lights? Rogers asked, sidling up next to them. She turned to him. The what? It's their claim to fame, Leon replied. At night, you could supposedly see UFO lights in the distance, but once scientists looked into it, they discovered it was actually headlight reflections off the atmosphere. Trenton snorted. Probably not gonna see much then. Well, if you did, you could really stick it to those alien-hating scientists, Reed countered. His friend shook his head. Guessing the zombies already did that. True, Reed admitted. Anyway, Leon piped up. I circled Marfa because it's the largest town you're going to pass through on this stretch of highway, so you need to be frosty when you go through in case there's some company on the road. I did a quick check on the satellite when preparing this map, but it went out of range before I got a detailed look. I didn't see much, but I wouldn't put much stock in that. Clara nodded. Thanks for the heads up. Trenton and Reed emerged from the trailer again after rummaging around, holding guns and rations and gas cans. Trenton handed Clara an AK-47, and she slung it over her back as they packed the saddlebags with supplies. Rogers inclined his head to the motorcycle. Can you manage that okay? He asked. She glared at him and hopped onto the bike, kickstarting it in a single attempt, revving the engine for effect. I got my first dirt bike when I was 10, she smirked. I think I can handle this, Grandpa Mobile. The detective scratched the back of his head, shooting her an apologetic look. Were you not paying attention to what I did earlier? Reed muttered under his breath, and Rogers cracked a smile. Go get him, tiger, he declared. Clara clipped her helmet on and shot him a wink before peeling out, tires squealing. What do you say, boys? Leon asked, swiping his hands together as she disappeared over the horizon. Y'all ready to get our party started? Trenton shook his head. Nope, but that's never stopped us before. Chapter Four Okay, fellas, you're gonna go six blocks straight down before hanging a right, Leon instructed as he handed out printed maps. A block up from that will be the warehouse buildings. The biggest one is on the corner, and unless something is structurally wrong with it, I think it's the best bet here. Trenton adjusted the assault rifle hanging across his back. Hopefully the doors are unlocked, or at the very least, unlockable. Just remember to keep the noise to a minimum, Leon reminded them. You'll be okay with banging noises, but limit the gunfire unless you want to attract a crowd. Rogers checked his holsters, making sure his machete and hunting knife were accessible. Where are we getting the gas from? Leon pointed to a small circle on his map, four blocks from the hospital on the far side. Small gas station here, and with any luck, you can get some from there. What about the generator noise? Reed cut in. Leon shook his head. It shouldn't resonate to the school horde, but you might get some nibbles from the hospital one. Won't be that big of a deal since we'll have to attract them shortly after, Rogers added. Trenton nodded as he studied his map. It's only about seven, eight blocks up from the hospital. We'll have plenty of time to get in position to trap them. Resistance at the gas station? The detective asked. Leon held out his hand, palm down, and wiggled it back and forth. I saw a little bit of a dark mass around it, but shouldn't be too big. Famous last words. Rogers pursed his lips. His friend shrugged. Won't be my famous last words on account of y'all not letting me join in. You know I'm right, though, the detective said firmly. Yeah, yeah, I know, Leon waved him off. Now come on, y'all need to get rolling, we're burning daylight. Rogers extended his fist for bumping. You keep an eye on that school group. 
Ain't nothing gonna get by me, and if they do, you'll be the first to hear about it, Leon promised as he completed the bump. The detective led his two companions over the barricade and began walking side by side away from the relative safety of their base. Their light footfalls on the asphalt drew the attention of two zombies that were stuck in a row of bushes off of the side of the road. They struggled and moaned, wriggling against the tight branches. Boys, do you want to do the honors? Rogers asked. Trenton nodded, drawing his machete. Yeah, we got you, boss. He and Reed casually headed over to the bushes, each slashing down hard with their blades, the zombie heads cracking open like fresh coconuts. They rejoined the detective, flicking their blades to get most of the gunk off. They traveled in silence, until reaching a chain-link fence that had succumbed to nature from years of neglect. That looks like the place, Rogers said quietly, as he stepped over the decrepit fence between two of the still-standing posts. Trenton and Reed followed, the former heading towards a large, white-paneled sliding door. It gave a little, but there was lots of gunk on the track, so he wiggled it hard. It squeaked a little in protest, and then rolled smoothly open. Sunlight poured into the dusty room, and Trenton let out a low whistle as he entered. Damn, this place is huge. What do you think, 10, maybe 12,000 square feet? Not sure, but it's definitely big enough for a few thousand zombies, Reed replied. Hey, Rogers, where you going? The detective surveyed the back wall. Figured it might be a good idea to make sure we can get out, he said. Unless one of you boys wants a front row seat to the barbecue. They glanced at each other and shared a chuckle at their shared short-sightedness. They moved quickly to catch up to their fearless leader. Rogers inspected a fire door brow furrowing, as he inspected it for an alarm trigger. Please don't fuck us, please don't fuck us, he muttered under his breath, as he gently pushed on the door handle. It stuck for a moment, before clicking free, and the door flung open. Thankfully, there was no alarm, just the sound of the door smacking against the side of the old building. Rogers headed outside into the small, grassy courtyard, surrounded by the same busted fence they'd crossed over so easily. Looks like we're good here, he declared, motioning to the main road they'd come in on, easily accessible from where they stood. Let's go check out the fuel situation. He led the way down a path, making sure there were no rocks or roots or debris in their way when they had to use this area to make a hasty escape later. They circled back around to the main road, and took cover behind an old SUV parked in the driveway of a house to survey the gas station proper. Fucking hell, Trenton hissed, at the sight of a few dozen zombies milling about by the pumps. That's a big group to have to hack down. Reed nodded in agreement. How in the world do we even do this? Hit and run, maybe? His buddy suggested. Smack one with our machete, then run back until another few break away from the pack and repeat? Reed shook his head. That's a tough sell with how close we are to that other group. We could lure them up to the barricade, Trenton tried. Rogers pursed his lips. And we'd run the risk of drawing the hospital group up with them. He peered through the window of the SUV, focusing on the dashboard. He checked around to see if there was a flashing light, indicating an alarm system, and saw nothing. He removed his assault rifle from his back and his two mates gaped at him. Are we just gonna say fuck it and open fire? Reed asked. The detective shook his head. Nah, I got an idea, though. Keep an eye on them, will ya? The young men nodded and peeked out around the back of the vehicle, staring at the walking corpses only about 150 yards away. Roger stood and used the butt of his rifle to smash in the driver's side window and then ducked down quickly. The trio held their breath for a full minute. Are they coming this way? Rogers whispered. Trenton shook his head. I think we're good. Another bullet dodged, the detective said, and reached in the busted window to unlock the door. He slithered inside, careful not to rub up against any broken glass, and ripped down the plastic panel beneath the steering column. Trenton snorted. So, they teach hot wiring at the academy, do they? Let's just say I may have left a few things off my academy application, Rogers replied, and then turned his head to give the boys a wink. 
When he found the wires he wanted, he paused. They may not have noticed the glass, but I'm pretty sure they'll notice this big bitch starting up. Where do you want us? Trenton asked. The detective inclined his head. I'm gonna punch this thing right through them and hopefully take most of them out, he explained. I want y'all to follow behind, pick off any strays and finish off any others you see. Good a plan as any, Reed said. The boys backed up a few feet, staying low in the knee so that they wouldn't be spotted. Rogers got into the driver's seat and then touched the wires together, the engine sputtering and then roaring to life. He tied it off quickly and then threw the vehicle into reverse before slamming the door shut and punching the accelerator. He squealed back into the street and then shoved the SUV into gear as the zombies quickly turned towards the noise. They shambled towards him, mouths open with drooling hunger, and the detective grinned as he slammed his foot on the gas. There was a little dip in the road just before contact, and the SUV took some air smacking on top of the first row of zombies before obliterating a good chunk of the corpses, sending them flying through the air or crushed beneath tires. He skidded to a stop in front of the gas station and jumped out, drawing his machete and immediately taking out a still writhing ghoul on the asphalt. Trenton and Reed rushed into the trail of guts and gore, slicing and dicing with their own blades, systematically taking out every still-moving zombie left. Rogers moved swiftly as well, lobotomizing the corpses one at a time. In a matter of minutes, the mini horde had been reduced to a simple pile of rotting and now actually lifeless flesh. Reed whooped and threw his arms up in celebration. Holy shit, that was bad fucking ass, detective, he exclaimed. I had no idea you were gonna go all dukes of hazard and fly through the goddamn air. Well, to be honest, neither did I. Rogers admitted. Guess this town wasn't very high up on the list for road improvements. Trenton clapped him on the shoulder. Regardless of whether it was intentional or not, it was pretty effective. That could be a useful strategy for when we take on the hospital group. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be the case, the detective replied, shaking his head. He headed back to the SUV and reached beneath the dash, popping the hood. The duo followed him as he released the latch and opened it, recoiling in disgust at the display. See what I mean? Rogers asked, as he motioned to the zombie bits clogging up the motor. Landing on them probably wasn't the best strategy. I got lucky there were only a handful. If this happened at the hospital, I'd be a box lunch. Trenton sighed. You're just dashing all my dreams today. Well, the day's not over yet, so there's still time to dash a few more. Rogers replied. Trenton chuckled, shaking his head. Come on, let's get that gas so we can get our barbecue set up, the detective urged, using his machete to wave at them with a dramatic flare. Reed saluted him. Aye, aye, detective. Chapter Five There were few cars scattered along the embankments of Highway 90, but Clara knew better than to stop to find out if there were threats inside of them. She let off the throttle a bit as she spotted the Marfa two miles sign, slowing to a stop in the middle of the road. She took a deep breath and unlatched the holster for her handgun, just in case she had to make a quick draw. Okay, two miles, I can do this, she said under her breath and double-checked her gas tank. It was just past half empty so enough if she had to make a quick escape. She eased the accelerator, heading forward at a slow and careful pace. Clara's heart thrummed hard in her chest. She expected to see some movement in the distance, but to her surprise, it looked completely deserted. Her brow furrowed as she hit the town limits, straining her eyes for any movement. There was absolutely none at all. She stopped the idling bike, holding herself up with her legs, and let out a loud yell. She put a hand on her gun barrel, expecting something, anything to tear out at her. But nothing happened. What the hell is going on here? She muttered. She eased into a slow putter, heading down the center line of the highway, peering suspiciously down each side street as she passed. The whole town looked completely ghosted. Well, if this place is abandoned, it might have some useful stuff, she thought. 
Can't hurt to look, right? She came to a stop in the main intersection, looking up at the sign pointing to the 22 miles to Fort Davis. Okay, I should be safe to investigate, right? She paused briefly and turned the bike, heading slowly down the main drag. The storefronts were all locked up, the shelves and windows completely empty. Nothing was broken, on fire, or had cars smashed into it. It was as if the town was raptured, taking everything valuable along with all the people. Clara chewed the inside of her cheek, a growing sense of unease gripping her chest. Not only was this insanely creepy, but if she couldn't find anything useful, then they were boned with the cartel. As she passed a little street a few blocks down from the main highway, she froze at the sight of a barricade up ahead. She stopped immediately and stared, knowing there was no point in trying to hide. If someone was going to see her, they would have spotted her coming. Looks like the local church group went the extra mile, she thought as she inched forward, making out a few giant crosses lining the road. Her stomach sank as she got closer, noticing that there were bodies stuck through the chest on the barricade, and a few impaled lengthwise, bloody wood sticking up out of their mouths. She put her hand to her mouth, stomach roiling as she came to a stop. There was a low moan, and Clara tensed, hand flying to her gun again. But upon listening harder, she realized it wasn't a zombie. She reluctantly looked up at the nearest cross, a slightly shifting body crucified there. She immediately dismounted her bike, rushing over as the man started weakly mumbling in Spanish. Hang tight, I'll see if I can get you down, she blurted, wringing her hands. Her heart clenched when she realized that his feet and hands had been pierced with railroad spikes, and she swallowed bile. I'm so sorry, she gasped, backing away slowly from the suffering man. Now why in the world would you feel sorry for that piece of shit? A man asked, his southern twang thick and close behind her. Clara immediately drew her gun, whipping around and coming face to face with a clean-cut cowboy. He was older than her, his clothes pristine, looking like he'd just stepped out of a cigarette ad from the 1980s. He held his hands up, palms out, but the four men standing behind him were armed to the teeth. That very well may be a valid question, she said, forcing her voice to stay steady. But what do you say before we talk about it? I put my friend here away. She inclined her head towards her gun. The man smiled, and if it weren't for the circumstances, it almost would have seemed warm and inviting. Might be in your best interest there, sweetheart, he drawled. Just take her nice and slow there, and we'll treat you nice. Just so we're clear, y'all ain't taking me anywhere, she said firmly. I can guarantee you that. He shook his head. Don't worry, treat you nice wasn't a euphemism for anything. Clara nodded and took a deep breath lowering her hands and sliding her gun back into its holster. She let her arms fall to her sides and let out her lungful as the four men pointed their guns at the ground. Now with that unpleasantness out of the way, the man continued, why don't you tell me what in the hell you were doing here and why you were trying to help that asshole? She swallowed hard. I'm just passing through, that's all. I didn't see anything moving in the town from the highway and thought I'd check it out. Supplies are going to be real scarce real soon. So you just thought you'd come and loot to your heart's content, huh? He asked, crossing his arms. She shrugged, trying to look nonchalant. Well, the place did look abandoned. Just didn't seem right to let stuff go to waste if there wasn't anybody here to use it. Fair enough, I'll give you that, he said, and motioned behind her. But that doesn't explain why you were willing to help that asshole, you sure nobody sent you to retrieve him and his buddies? Clara shook her head. I have no clue who any of them are, she promised. I just saw something that, frankly, I'll never be able to unsee. It was just an instinctual response to offer to help. She turned her head so that she didn't have to see the impaled corpses in her periphery. The cowboy studied her closely, eyes narrowed, sizing her up. So the cartel didn't send a pretty little white girl to get their men? She snarled at the mention of the cartel. They have other uses for pretty little white girls. She let the insinuation hang in the air, 
forcing down the memories of her less fortunate friends who'd suffered before she escaped the clutches of the Rivas. You sure these guys are with the cartel? Given what they did in El Paso, this seems a bit far out for them. Yeah, we're sure, the cowboy nodded. They came from the east a few days after this stuff started going down. They rolled in here like they owned the place and started causing trouble. So we put an end to that real quick. She put a finger up in the air. Okay then, excuse me for just a moment. She turned her back on the men and drew her handgun, popping off a quick shot into the crucified man's leg. The man screamed in anguish, blood pouring from his busted mouth, and she holstered her gun immediately, turning back around. Apologies, she said hotly. I don't really have a good relationship with the cartel, so I needed to let out some frustration. The cowboy raised an eyebrow. Well, I think it's safe to say you ain't with them. She shook her head. They took over El Paso last week and started doing horrific, let me go ahead and just stop you right there. He cut her off. We really don't care about your problems, as we have more than enough to deal with ourselves. Now you've convinced me that you're not one of them, which is the only reason you haven't joined them up on that cross. We just want to be left alone to fend for ourselves. Clara put a hand on her hip. There's only five of you. We have a community you can come to. We have a community too up in Fort Davis, he replied. And just a free bit of advice. We won't be nearly this friendly if you or any of your friends come a-knocking. So why don't you hop on your little bike there and go back to where you came from? She narrowed her eyes. I need to pass through here tonight, and maybe in the future too, she said sternly. If you don't want me in your town, I'll honor that request. But you can't shut down that road, because doing so would mean the death of my community. And at the moment, we're the only buffer between you and the cartel. While I'm impressed with your handiwork, I don't think they'd share that sentiment. She motioned the crucified man, fire in her eyes. The cowboy pressed his fingers together, as if praying. All right, he finally said. I'll give you free passage on this highway. No stopping or turnoffs. We have a deal? Deal, she replied immediately, putting a hand to her chest. He nodded. Head on out, then. Clara didn't wait for any further conversation and hopped on the bike. She started it up and peeled out, back towards the highway. As she crossed the outskirts, she pulled off to the side of the road, shutting down the bike and leaning over, chest heaving with panic. She took deep lungfuls of air and wiped the sweat from her forehead. That could have gone a whole lot worse. Chapter Six That does not look fun, Trenton whispered, as the trio ducked behind a low wooden fence on the side of the road. The hospital parking lot was packed with several hundred zombies huddling around and shambling about. Some growled as they bonked against each other. Some simply stared off into space. Come on, it's only five, maybe six hundred zombies at most, Reed joked under his breath. You've got a machete, have at it. He motioned to the empty space between them and the horde, roughly a football field away. Rogers frowned at the two-story hospital, with its busted windows and the ambulance smashed into the side. Actually, not a bad idea. Um, Rogers? Trenton stammered, eyes wide. Not sure what you're thinking about, but you can count us out. The detective scoffed. I'm not saying hack them all to death, but we're going to have to do something to lure them away. We have guns, you know, Reed put in. Rogers shook his head. Do you want to risk attracting the school horde? He asked, waiting for his team to begrudgingly agree. Speaking of which, we should probably check on that. He pulled out his walkie-talkie, making sure to turn the volume down to the lowest setting. Come in, Leon. After a moment of silence and a soft click, Leon said, Hey, detective, how you boys doing down there? Oh, you know, just scouting out the neighborhood, Rogers replied quietly. Heard the schools were good in this area, so figured we'd check out the real estate. Leon chuckled in response. Oh yeah, found any good deals? Eh, you know, plenty of property up for grabs. But from what we're seeing, it's a pretty rough neighborhood, the detective said. Speaking of which, hang on a second, Leon said. And then there was a click, 
before the trio heard the crack of a rifle off in the distance. Sorry about that, he came back. Had a straggler that wanted to head your way. Trenton pursed his lips. Hopefully that gunshot didn't attract more. A single rifle shot is hard to locate due to the echo, Rogers explained. Firing off multiples, however. You boys still there? Leon's voice cut in on the radio. The detective raised the walkie-talkie to his lips. Yeah, sorry. Had to put Trenton's mind at ease over your shots. No worries, came the reply. So where y'all at? Just getting ready to move the horde into storage, Rogers said. The radio went silent, and then another shot echoed. Far be it for me to tell you how to do your job, but y'all might want to speed up your raid, Leon said. The detective sighed. Shit, what now? Just had a dozen or so wander past in your direction, came the reply. I know y'all can handle that amount, but you know how these things like to conga line. It's always something, isn't it? Rogers asked. Leon chuckled darkly. Wouldn't be our luck if it wasn't. All right, we're going dark so we can get this done, Rogers said. Be safe, brother. The detective nodded. You know it. He clicked off the radio and stashed it back in his pocket. Okay, new plan. You two think you can handle moving these fuckers to storage? Shouldn't be a big deal, Trenton replied. What are you going to do? He motioned to the building. As soon as you get them out of the parking lot, I'm going in. Alone? Reed hissed. Rogers nodded. Yep, alone. He motioned towards his projected path. I'm going to make a beeline to the pharmacy and stock up. With any luck, I'll be in and out by the time you get the bonfire roaring. But what if there are zombies inside? Reed demanded. You gonna machete them all? Hell no, I'm gonna open fire, the detective said. Trenton threw his arms up. Won't that attract the school horde? Nah, hospitals are well insulated, so that should muffle the sound enough that it won't carry, Rogers assured them. His companions shared a skeptical look, and Reed stammered. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Truth be told, neither have I, Rogers admitted. But it sounds like something that should be true, right? Trenton scrubbed his hands down his face. Given that it sounds like we're already on the clock, I don't think it's going to matter much. Rogers shrugged. Well, we'd better get a move on then. Chapter seven. So do you want a rock, paper, scissors to decide who goes up to get their attention? Reed asked as they casually walked up the street to get in position. Trenton laughed. I just figured I was gonna pull rank on you. And here I was, thinking we were equals. Reed shook his head. His friend smirked. Well, that's what you get for thinking. They stopped behind a garbage can, surveying the parking lot. All kidding aside, how do you want to play this? Reed asked. His partner took a deep breath. We get their attention and casually walk the four blocks to the warehouse. Once we get them going, I say you run up ahead and get out of sight. I'll lead them through the back and you lock them up. Sounds easy enough, Reed agreed. Trenton shook his head. Somehow I doubt it will be. His friend extended his fist, holding it out over his open palm. Trenton raised an eyebrow. What are you doing? Rock, paper, scissors, Reed said. Let's do it. His partner chuckled and shook his head, and then glanced at the ground. How about we play rock, rock, rock? He picked up a fist-sized rock off of the ground and held it up. Ooh, I like this idea a lot better, Reed said with a grin. They gathered up a few rocks and crouched behind a wayward car, one behind the hood, one behind the trunk. They nodded at each other and then stood up, firing their projectiles. The first few landed just short of the parking lot, but after a few tosses, they got the range down and began bonking some zombies. Oh yeah, that one got him good, Trenton declared as his rock smacked into the back of a corpse's head. A few zombies turned and saw the two walking meals across the street, moaning their excitement and alerting their friends. I think we got their attention, Reed said, as the ghouls began to shamble towards them and dropped his rocks. Trenton followed suit, and they backed slowly down the road. 
This spurred the horde, and the faster zombies leapt to life, the group moving like a wave towards them. I think I'm good from here, he said. Go get in position. They exchanged a fist bump, and Reed said, See you in a few, bud. He took off running towards the warehouse. Trenton turned his back to the horde, keeping a brisk pace and constantly checking on them over his shoulder. That's it, right this way, he called, voice shaking. We got a barbecue all set up for you. Rogers peeked out from behind a wooden shed in a backyard near the parking lot as the horde began to move away from the hospital entrance. Good job, boys, he said quietly. He checked his handgun to make sure that the magazine was full and the safety was off, and then pulled his rifle from his back and did the same. He watched the last of the stragglers leave the parking lot, and then darted soundlessly across the asphalt to the front entrance. He ducked quickly behind a pillar in the breezeway, rolling around the inside and kneeling down. A sigh of relief escaped him as he peeked back around, noting that none of the zombies had noticed his stealthy approach. He pulled out a flashlight and clipped it to the top of his assault rifle, and then carefully opened the front door into the lobby, closing it as quietly behind him as he could. He scanned the dim room quickly, bile rising in his throat at the scent of rotted flesh. It appeared that someone had put up a fight in there, riddling everything with bullet holes, probably on day zero if the decomposition was anything to go by. He breathed through his mouth and immediately regretted it, the sweet taste of copper thick in the air. Rogers headed up to the hospital doors at the back of the lobby, peering through the small windows embedded there. The hallway was blood spattered, overturned gurneys and medical carts sporadically strewn around. By the nurse's station, there was a bit of movement, so he squeezed through the door as low to the ground as he could, ever so gently closing it behind him. The hallway was mostly dark, save for the flickering emergency lights, sucking out the last bit of juice from their batteries. He turned his flashlight off to avoid drawing attention to himself, and moved at a deliberate pace down the hallway. He paused at each doorway, checking inside for any surprises waiting to jump out at him. The third door revealed a one-legged nurse, missing several large chunks of flesh from her body, sitting up and gurgling, coagulated blood shifting around a massive wound in her throat. It struggled to turn towards him and failed, so Rogers gently shut the door, entombing the creature. He continued towards the nurse's station, where the emergency lights were less reliable. He readied his flashlight, with no other choice, and drew his knife with his free hand. He raised the rifle and clicked the button on the flashlight, illuminating the area. A bloodied zombie in tattered green scrubs immediately whipped around to face the bright light. Rogers rushed forward and hopped the desk, whipping around just in time to slam the blade into her eye as she lunged for his face. He immediately pulled the blade back and holstered the knife, aiming his assault rifle around the room. Everywhere he pointed it, he lit up a zombie. At least a dozen creatures in various states of decay shambled from the shadows, no more than 15 feet from his little barrier. Fucking hell, he breathed, and wildly swung the flashlight around, looking for any escape. He looked down and spotted a little map taped to the desk, and snatched it up before darting to the open hallway to the left. Two zombies stumbled into his path, and he lowered his shoulder, barreling into it like a linebacker. The impact sent the ghouls smacking back into his buddy, the two of them ending up on the ground. Rogers didn't bother sticking around to deal with them, the groans from his pursuers growing ever closer. He raised his weapon to shine ahead, noting a few dozen more zombies working their way towards him from the opposite end. Over halfway to them, he noted the elevators and stairs signs and picked up into a full sprint. But as he gained on the stairwell, he knew with a sinking stomach that he wasn't going to make it before they did. Fuck it, they know I'm here anyway, he thought, and raised his rifle. He concentrated his fire on the zombies closest to the stairs, tearing into their torsos as he continued to run and squint in the low light. The force of the bullets drove them back, just enough for him to throw the stairwell door open and fling himself inside. As bodies smacked into the door, 
Something grabbed a hold of his assault rifle strap, spinning him around. Rogers put a foot against the doorframe, jerking back on the horizontal release bar to try to crush the arm wriggling in from the hallway. Fuck, 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 he grunted at the sound of moans from above him, echoing shuffling feet down the stairs. He jerked hard on the rifle, but he couldn't shake the creature's grip, the group of them managing to get it wide enough for a head to poke through. He managed to twist the gun, just enough to spray a hail of bullets through the zombie's skull. He kept firing, in hopes that he'd hit whatever creature had a death grip on his strap. But it didn't work. His arm caught in the strap tightly, and he jerked on it, struggling to get it free. The gun clicked empty as a zombie tumbled down the flight of stairs, smacking its face hard on the concrete landing a few feet away. It was stunned for a moment, but not dead, and began to slither towards him. This just ain't my day, Rogers groaned, and reached down with his tangled hand to get a good grip on the release bar, and drew his knife with his free hand. He started hacking away at the strap, desperation making the movements erratic. He cried out with the force of it as he rubbed the blade against the fabric, and the zombie from the landing staggered to its feet, reaching for him. The strap finally gave way, and he let go of the rifle, shoving hard against the door to surprise the creatures into falling backwards. He drew his handgun as the rifle disappeared into the mass of rotting flesh and shot the stairwell zombie in the forehead at point blank, splattering rotted brains all over the wall. Rogers immediately ran halfway up the flight, dropping a trio of ghouls coming down to greet him with three precise shots to the head. He ducked around the falling bodies, expertly dodging them to get up to the next landing. As zombies poured into the stairwell from the first floor, he tore up the flight to the second and burst into the second floor hallway, gun aimed high. He slammed back against the door with his back, but it didn't latch, apparently broken. Figures, Rogers muttered, and swept the hallway quickly, seeing no immediate threat. Of course, he couldn't see very well, given the flickering emergency lights and the little bit of sunlight filtering in through some of the rooms. He pulled out the paper map, quickly turning it around to the proper orientation. He clenched his jaw at the sound of zombies staggering up the stairs and pushed against the metal fire door as he studied the map. He finally located the pharmacy at the end of the hallway on the second floor. He threw himself off of the door immediately, sprinting towards his goal, ignoring the zombies staggering out from the rooms towards the noise. One got too close for comfort, and he smashed it in the face with the butt of his gun on the way by. Upon reaching the door, he threw it open into the waiting area. There was a zombie slouched in a corner chair, and he fired into its forehead before slamming the door and locking it. The zombies pressed themselves up against it, banging and gnawing at the plexiglass, but it held. Rogers let out a deep breath, not realizing he'd been holding it for a while. He approached the plexiglass wall divider, releasing the door and doing a sweep of the pharmacist's area. Thankfully, there was nothing. He glanced back at the main door to make sure that it was secure, and then checked his magazine. He sighed at the sight of far fewer shots than he'd like, reaching to check his belt and finding only a single mag left. He pulled out his walkie-talkie. Hey, Leon, you want calm? He asked. After a few moments of just the banging on the door to keep him company, Leon came back. Yeah, buddy, I got you loud and clear. You find what we need? Yep, sure did, Rogers replied. Unfortunately, I wasn't the only one. Leon's voice was laced with concern. That doesn't sound promising. Well, nothing bit me, so it could be worse, the detective assured him. Am I gonna need to send a rescue party your way? His friend asked immediately. Roger shook his head. Unless you wanna lead the camp, that's gonna be an affirmative. Shit, man, I'd lead the party myself before I agree to that, came the reply, and they shared a laugh. Well, you just sit tight, bud. I'll send the boys your way right after they get the barbecue set up. Appreciate it, the detective replied. Tell them I'm on the mic so I can talk them in. Ten four, Leon promised. Roger set the radio down on the counter, leaving the volume turned up. 
He felt around beneath the desk for some bags and discovered a duffel bag full of clothes. He dumped the garments on the floor and then turned towards the shelves of hospital-grade drugs. In the meantime, I'm going to do a little shopping. Chapter 8 Trenton strolled down the middle of the road at a brisk pace, moving with a swagger to mask his nerves. He glanced over his shoulder often, trying to keep a good 15 to 20 yards between himself and the horde. Reed, you'd better have found a good hiding spot, he muttered to himself as the warehouse came into view. At about a half a block away, he sped up to a run and approached the large sliding door that stood open for him. He turned around and took a deep breath. Right this way, you zombie-ass motherfuckers, he whooped, waving his arms wildly. We have a little treat set up for you. Just follow me and you'll get what you deserve. He waited as long as he dared, staring into the void, dead eyes of his pursuers, their mouths open and full of crimson goo. Once they were within a few feet, he whipped around and walked into the building, slow but purposeful, as he continued to yell. Come on now, everybody get inside, he called, curling his hands around his mouth. No stragglers. He moonwalked backwards through the building, and about two-thirds of the way across, made a beeline for the back door. Don't mind me, y'all, just gonna step out for a bit of fresh air, he cried, and threw open the door to freedom. Trenton secured it from the outside, and then stood at one of the windows, knocking and banging on the panes to continue to draw the ghouls towards him. Welcome to the company barbecue, motherfuckers. Reed hissed as another branch cut into his neck, but didn't dare make a noise. Getting poked by a few branches was a small price to pay for having a good hiding spot from the gigantic horde of flesh-eating monsters. It was difficult to stay patient as he watched the zombies meander their way into the warehouse, but he definitely felt more relaxed when Trenton made it out the other side. Come on, almost there, he thought, as the ghouls piled in. You can do it. A few minutes later, the last group pushed through the sliding door, and he surveyed the area. There were a few zombies caught on the busted fencing, but not so many that he couldn't deal with them alone. Reed jumped out of the brush, hissing again, as a particularly sharp branch sliced open his forearm. He shook his head and jogged towards the warehouse, vaulting over a dip in the fence and ignoring the grunting ghouls in favor of the sliding door. As he took hold of it, a few creatures turned at the squeaking sound, opening their mouths with excitement. Not today, bub, not today, Reed said, and slammed it shut, sealing the horde inside. He took a step back and then nearly leapt out of his skin when he realized Trenton was standing right behind him. Jesus fuck, dude, watch it with that shit. A little jumpy there, his friend grinned. Reed wrinkled his nose. After the week we've had, the question is why aren't you jumpy? Ugh, too busy, Trenton replied, and headed over to the fence to dispatch the tangled zombies there. As he stabbed the last one in the head with his machete, he turned around and surveyed the area. Holy shit, I think this actually worked. Reed nodded, double-checking that the door was secure. Should I get the fire going? Two shots cracked in the distance before Trenton could answer. Maybe we should check in with Leon first, he said, and pulled out his walkie-talkie. As soon as he turned it on, a voice came bellowing out of the speaker. In the hell are you boys? I swear if y'all are dead, I'm gonna kick your ass. Trenton grinned and hit the button. Easy there, big fella, we're here. Thank the good sweet lord, Leon came back. Guess my shots got your attention. Trenton's brow furrowed. That was a little risky, don't you think? Not nearly as risky as what's headed your way, came the reply, and both boys looked at each other, wide-eyed. Trenton swallowed hard and then clicked the button again. What's coming our way? Looks like a group of three, maybe four hundred of those fuckers. Something got their attention, and they broke away from the school group, Leon explained. The younger man nodded. Okay, well, as soon as Rogers gets here, we'll get the barbecue going and be back on the right side of the fence. Yeah, about that, Leon replied, dragging his words a little. He's gonna need your help. 
Reed swore under his breath as his partner asked, Where is he? Second floor of the hospital in the pharmacy, came the reply. He's on calm, so he'll be able to talk you in. How much time we got? Trenton asked. Thirty, maybe forty minutes max, Leon said. They're a ways away from you, but they look like they were going at a pretty good clip. The younger man took a deep breath. Looks like we're going free fire then. Shit, I would, Leon chuckled. Check those doors to see how sturdy they are, Trenton instructed his partner. Reed's brow furrowed. What for? Cause we're gonna burn this bitch on the way out, his friend replied. Might be a good way to cover our tracks. He raised his radio again as Reed shook his head and headed to the doors. All right, Leon, here's what we're doing. We're gonna go get Rogers and then set the warehouse ablaze on our way out. My thinking is that the fire will cover our retreat. As good an idea as any, Leon came back. Just to be safe, though, I'll send some more men to that barricade in case you have company tailing you. Trenton nodded. Good call. We'll be in touch. It's solid enough, Reed said as he headed back over. It should hold for a while. His partner clapped him on the shoulder. Okay, let's get the gas cans ready, because we may not have much time when we get back. Then we're going on a rescue mission. Chapter 9 Clara pulled off of the interstate, stopping at the top of the exit to get her bearings. She planted her feet on the ground and pulled out Leon's map, making sure that she was in the right place. This has got to be it, she thought. Doesn't look like there's much of anything past this for quite a while. She eased on the accelerator, rolling over the bridge and towards the buildings in the distance. She took it slow and steady, making sure that nothing was going to jump out at her. As she got closer, there was no doubt she was in the right place. Out of the four small buildings, one was a two-story structure with beautiful curtains in the upstairs windows. It looked homey, like somebody had decorated with care. The other three looked like storage buildings. Clara parked the bike and hopped off, drawing her handgun just in case. She headed through the center of the buildings, to the far side of the two-story. Around the corner, there was a large truck sitting there. It looked uninhabited, and she quickly checked it to be sure. With no signs of life or unlife, she rounded the back of the truck and reached up to unlatch the back. At the telltale click of a cocking gun, she froze. I'd consider it a personal favor if you'd stop right there, a man said. Clara turned slowly to see an older redneck aiming a rifle at her from a second floor window. I'm not here to do anybody any harm, she said, holding her hands high. That is good to know, he said. But if it's all the same to you, we'd rather not take any chances. The door beside her opened, and a large skinhead emerged, followed by a fit-looking red-headed woman, both with guns trained on her. My friend Jeff here is going to come relieve you of your weapon, the woman declared. You so much as flinch, and it'll be the last thing you ever do. Clara nodded in agreement, taking a deep breath. The skinhead, apparently Jeff, moved cautiously towards her, taking the handgun quickly before gently lifting the AK-47 from her back. He shot her an apologetic look. Don't take this personally, but I need to pat you down for other weapons. She raised an eyebrow, surprised at his politeness. Do what you got, a big fella, she replied, a little at ease with his care in regards to touching her. She's clean, he said as he grabbed her blades, and the redhead nodded at him before holstering her own weapon. The woman motioned to the redneck in the window. You can put your hands down, but try anything, and Rufus up there will end you quick. We clear? Clear. Clara promised, and lowered her arms. Now I thought we were crystal fucking clear with you Sonora assholes that if anybody followed us, we'd wipe out the entire town. The redhead snapped. Clara's brow furrowed, and she chewed the inside of her cheek. Sonora, I don't know what you're talking about. You didn't follow us from Sonora? The other woman crossed her arms. Clara shrugged, shaking her head. I'd be willing to bet I couldn't find that town on a map, assuming it's even big enough to be on a map. I'm from El Paso. 
Well, at least I was before the cartel came. The duo shared a glance, full of concern and confusion. What the hell are you talking about with the cartel? Jeff asked. Clara swallowed hard. The Rivas cartel poured over the border when this thing was just getting started. They have complete control of the city now. Jesus Christ, Jeff breathed. The redhead took a deep breath. So how did you get out? I was lucky and got smuggled out by some cartel members who aren't a fan of what they're doing to civilians, Clara explained. There's a group of about a hundred of us that are in a town called Fabens that's just outside the city. The redhead pursed her lips for a moment, and when she spoke, her voice was stern. That's quite the tale there, but I'm inclined to believe you. However, that doesn't explain what you're doing here, or how you even found us for that matter. Clara opened her mouth to reply, but the redneck in the window gave a whistle. Ain't you being a little hard on that there girl? He called. The redhead turned and looked up at him, eyebrow raised. I'm just asking the necessary questions, Rufus. I know, and I'm all for it, he replied, putting up a hand. But it's pretty damn clear she ain't from Sonora, and since it's within the realm of possibility she's been fighting off the cartel for the last week, I'm guessing she could use a little break, don't you think? The redhead smiled, features softening, and shook her head. Even in this tough times, you still got a soft heart, old timer. Don't go blaming me, you the one who melted it, he replied with a wink. The woman turned and approached the newcomer, extending her hand. I'm Lacey Sparks, but everybody just calls me Sparks. I'm Clara, she replied, and shook firmly. Nice to meet you, Clara, Sparks said. It seems as though you got the Rufus seal of approval, so why don't you come upstairs and take a load off for a bit? Chapter 10 The upstairs apartment wasn't decorated anymore, save for the homey curtains and a halfway decent living room set. Jeff had a camping grill in the corner by the window, some spam sizzling on it, while Clara sat and chatted with Sparks and Rufus and their other companion, Mary. So these motherfuckers have you running all over creation in search of alcohol? Rufus slapped his knee. Fucking end of the world and y'all playing fetch. Clara sighed heavily. Preaching to the choir. I'm guessing there's not a lot between El Paso and here. Mary leaned back, crossing her legs. Clara shrugged. We cleaned out the only town that's really accessible without having a full-scale army. Well, how in the hell did you find us? Rufus asked, resting his arms on his knees. Not like we're out here advertising. The younger woman pointed vaguely over her shoulder, as if motioning back to town. That would be because of Leon, she said. He's some sort of military intelligence officer and has a satellite uplink. Must be nice to have that kind of fanciness, Rufus replied, rolling his eyes. She held up a finger. In theory, yeah, but I've had two groups point guns at me today as a result. Yeah, sorry about that. Rufus admitted, puffing out his cheeks for a moment. Can't be too careful these days. Clara shrugged. Hey, at least y'all are feeding me, she said with a smile. The group down in Marfa threatened to kill me if I ever came back. They seem like a fun bunch, the older man replied, sarcasm evident in his tone. Don't think I've ever heard of anybody being crucified. Well, at least not recently. Mary! Somebody called from one of the bedrooms, his voice weak. Mary, I need you. She got up quickly from the couch. Please excuse me, she said, and hurried off to the bedroom, shutting the door behind her. Is everything okay? Clara asked gently. Sparks nodded. Yeah, that's her husband, Ricky, she explained. He, he took a bullet in the shoulder a few days back. Is he going to make it? The younger woman pursed her lips. Sparks sighed. To be honest, we don't know, she admitted. We were able to get the bullet out, but we don't really have the resources to handle a wound like that. None of us are doctors, but we're pretty sure it's beginning to get infected. We tried making a run into Fort Stockton, but that place has the biggest shitstorm I've ever seen, 
Rufus added. And I was in Nam. Clara pressed her palms together. We have a doctor in Fabens. I have no doubt you'd be welcome there. To be quite frank, we're running low on able-bodied people, so y'all would really be a godsend. Jeff headed over with plates, handing out the portions of fried spam. Don't take this the wrong way, he said. But I don't think any of us are particularly interested in moving closer to the cartel. We had a bit of a rough ride at the start of this, Sparks explained. A lot of good people died. Rufus raised a hand and through a mouthful of food said, and a lot of bad ones too, thanks to us. This is true, Sparks admitted. Clara dove into the fried canned meat, savoring every bite. She moaned as she chewed, closing her eyes and smacking her lips afterwards. After composing herself, she said, well, consider it a standing offer. I don't know how much food you got in that truck, but I'd venture a guess and say it isn't going to last forever. The trio shared a glance, but didn't reply. Having you as a part of the community could mean the difference between you having a place to go when the truck runs empty and you having to fight the cartel on your own, Clara added, and then shoved another generous forkful of meat into her mouth. Spark sat up straight. We'll consider it. It's all I ask, Clara replied through a mouthful of food. Rufus shook his head. I don't know if we can actually move Ricky in his condition. There was a moment of silence, and Clara set down her empty plate. Now, I can't make any promises, but some in my group are making a raid on a hospital today. If they're successful, I might be able to bring you something to help your friend out. Oh, yeah? Jeff crossed his arms, raising an eyebrow. And what do you want in return for that? Clara shook her head. Nothing at all. She raised her chin. I can see that look in your eyes, and I know what you're thinking. The reality is we have a monster on our doorstep who comes knocking on a regular basis. Frankly, it'd just be nice to know we have a friend out here. Jeff nodded and sat down, digging into his plate of food as Rufus and Spark stared at each other. Clara looked between them, not sure what was going on, but it appeared they were having some kind of silent conversation with their eyes. Finally, Rufus stood and headed off to one of the other bedrooms, the noise of rustling and clinking following. A moment later, he emerged with a large, unopened bottle of tequila. Here, he said as he held it out. I want you to have this. Clara took it gingerly, eyes wide. My goodness, thank you, she said, voice thick. Jeff elbowed the redneck as he sat back down. Breaking out the secret stash, huh? Well, like she said, it's good to know we have friends out there, Rufus replied and leaned forward on his knees again. Now I'm gonna make you a deal. If you come back tomorrow with something that can help my friend in there get better, I'll give you a case of that stuff. Her eyes lit up, nearly bugging out of her head. She opened her mouth and closed it again, and then sprung forward, launching her arms around his neck. A case of high-end tequila would buy them weeks or more. Thank you so much, she gushed as she pulled back from him. I will do everything I can to get back tomorrow with something to help him. And if I'm going to make it back before nightfall, I should get on the road. Spark stood, extending her hand. For what it's worth, we'll consider your offer to join you, she promised. At the very least, though, just know you have some friends out here. Thank you. Clara replied, shaking her hand firmly, offering a smile that threatened to moisten her eyes. Sparks motioned behind her. And Jeff, why don't you go wrap her up something to go? It's a long haul back to El Paso. The skinhead nodded and headed back to the grill, grabbing up a can and a bag of chips. Oh, I almost forgot, Rufus said, snapping his fingers, and headed to the counter to grab Clara's weapons. Come on, I'll carry him down for you. They followed her outside and got her packed up. She hopped into the seat and swallowed hard again, fighting back tears of relief at the treasures in her saddlebags. I'll see you tomorrow, she promised, and kicked the engine to life before peeling out of the parking lot. So much for the quiet life, huh, girl? Rufus asked and wrapped his arm around Sparks' shoulders. 
She leaned into him as she gazed at the disappearing motorcycle. Well, we've already fought militia and crooked cops. Might as well add Mexican drug cartels to the list. We're getting real close to apocalypse bingo, Jeff added, and the three shared a chuckle before heading back inside. Chapter 11 Rogers, you there? Trenton asked into the walkie-talkie as he crouched by the entrance of the hospital. Reed checked his assault rifle, waiting with bated breath for a reply. Read you loud and clear. The detective came back. You boys ready to come rescue me? Yep, just tell us how to get to you and we'll be right up. Trenton replied, tossing his own rifle at Reed to get it checked. It's straight through the main doors, then hang a left at the nurse's station, Rogers explained. The stairs are down on the right, and I'll be at the far end of the hall next to the horde of zombies when you get to the second floor. Trenton took a deep breath. How many of these things are we talking about? He asked. At least 30 or 40 outside of where I am, came the reply. God only knows how many are downstairs or in the stairwell. The lighting is less than desirable, so I didn't get a good look. The younger man sighed. Zombies in the dark, because why should this be easy? Because if it was easy, you wouldn't have anything to bitch about, Rogers replied, and the two boys shook their heads, smiling. Trenton scratched the back of his head. Well, Leon said we got company headed our way, so we're officially on the clock. You be ready to move when we get there. My bags are packed, Rogers promised. See you in a few, Trenton said, and clipped his walkie-talkie to his belt, taking his gun back from his partner. So, what's the story? Weapons are primed and ready, Reed said. We each have two mags in reserve, so we have 90 shots each. Trenton nodded. As long as there are less than 180 zombies in there, we should be good. His partner barked a laugh. That's cute that you think I'm good enough to score headshots reliably with this thing, let alone in the dark. Okay, spray and pray it is then, Trenton replied, clapping his friend on the shoulder. Just make sure you don't shoot me when you're doing that. Reed grinned. I'll do my best, but no promises. His partner shook his head and pulled out his flashlight, attaching it to the end of his rifle. Reed did the same, and then moved in through the front door, leading the way into the dim lobby. As they peered through the windows of the main hospital, there was a movement in the shadows. I got left, Trenton whispered. You go right. Reed nodded, and they burst through the door in tandem moving swiftly down the hallway. Several zombies that had been aimlessly staggering about, looking for Rogers, whipped around to face their fresh meal. The duo stopped just short of the end of the hallway, taking a knee into firing position. They took careful aim and squeezed off shot after shot, Trenton taking out three zombies with perfect aim. Reed grew frustrated with his three on the right, and fired a dozen shots in rapid succession before they finally fell. Christ, dude, you good? Trenton asked. Reed huffed. Yeah, just, yeah. You're gonna have to go a little easier on the ammo there, Trenton replied firmly. We don't exactly have a huge supply of it. His partner reached to his belt and grabbed his two mags, handing them over. These are gonna be better used by you. He flung the rifle over onto his back and drew his handgun, cocking it with a flourish. I can handle this. Dead moans echoed throughout the nurse's station, putting both men on high alert. Hallway, Trenton hissed, and they crept forward over the unmoving corpses. The hallway towards the stairwell was full of at least a dozen creatures, staggering forward, arms outstretched. Trenton took quick but careful aim and fired, hitting the first one in the forehead brain blowing out all over the wall. The next two fell easily as well, putting a significant gap between the nurse's station and the rest of the group. Move up, he said, and led the way into the hall, opening fire. Zombies fell left and right, with only the occasional miss. Where the fuck did you learn to shoot like that? Reed demanded, stomping after his friend on their way to the stairwell door. Trenton just grinned and opened it up pointing his flashlight up into the darkness. There was no sound or movement, so he led the way up the first flight, Reed close behind. At the second floor landing, 
He peered through the crack in the slightly open door that had the broken latch. He shook his head at the huge horde of zombies jam-packed into the hallway, blocking off the pharmacy completely. He motioned for Reed to go back, and they crept down the stairs, closing the door behind them at the bottom. So how the fuck are we doing this one? Reed hissed. Pretty sure even if I knew how to shoot, we'd get overwhelmed pretty quick. Trenton paced back and forth, lips pressed into a thin line. Trenton, Reed demanded. We're on a clock, man, what are we gonna do? His friend paused, focusing on something near the nurse's station. He immediately stopped pacing and headed that way. How much can you bench press? He called over his shoulder. Reed threw his hands up. What? Bench press, Trenton replied, waving him over. How much? I don't know, 260, his friend said, exasperated. 270? Trenton grinned and reached behind one of the privacy curtains. I can work with that. He pulled out two wooden crutches and tossed them on the nurse's stand. He grabbed his knife and jammed the tip of the blade into the end of it. Do I even want to know what you're thinking? Reed asked. Trenton shrugged. Well, since you can't shoot, you're going to hold them at bay so I can take them out. His partner scrubbed his hands down his face, the mere idea making his brain pulse. So, just to recap, you want me to stab a couple of zombies in the chest with some crutches and hold the entire horde in place so you can pick them off? I mean, unless you have a better idea, Trenton grinned. Reed growled as he watched his friend crack the second crutch, turning it into a pointed spear. If we survive this, I'm totally taking tomorrow off. Trenton barked a laugh. You and me both. Chapter 12 Trenton and Reed made their way back to the top of the stairs, the ladder in the front with the soft end of the crutches braced into his shoulders. He took a deep breath and nodded at his partner, receiving a nod in return before rushing through the door. He took a few steps forward and then lunged at two surprised zombies, impaling them in the back. The creatures shrieked and flailed their arms, causing their brethren to turn around and survey the situation. Trenton stood a few feet back, aiming carefully with his rifle, and then firing rounds one by one. The corpses dropped, but dozens more took their place, pressing into Reed's personal space at an alarming rate. He struggled and pushed with all his might, using his weight and upper body strength to fling his shield zombies back and forth, attempting to knock over the advancing horde. Trenton continued to fire as quickly as he could, while still being effective, landing headshot after headshot. There's too fucking many of them, man, Reed screamed, taking a step back under the weight of the pack. Trenton's rifle gave a dull click. Switching mag, he cried, releasing the magazine and slapping in a new one. Just as he did so, one of the crutches gave a foreboding snap and crunch, and Reed shoved it forward in a last-ditch attempt to send the ghouls stumbling backwards. With that hand free, he drew his handgun, aimed and fired into the shield zombie's head, giving them an extra few seconds, but leaving a gaping hole in their defensive line. We're not gonna finish him off in time, Reed yelled, even as Trenton began firing again, the zombies filling up the hallway even faster than before. He glanced over his shoulder, spotting one open door between them and the end of the hallway. Keep them at bay, he cried, and tore over to it, lunging inside to give the room a quick sweep. We're clear, get in here, he screamed back into the hallway, and Reed shoved the impaled zombie into its friends, before leaping back and running for safety. As he slid inside, Trenton slammed the door shut, pressing his back against it for good measure, as a bevy of thumps hit it. Reed cursed under his breath, scrubbing his hands down his face as his friend pulled out his walkie-talkie. Rogers, you there? Trenton asked. The detective came back immediately. You boys on break or something? I still see some zombies. Yeah, well, there were a few more than anticipated, Trenton replied dryly. We're at the end of the hall in one of the surgery rooms. Rogers clucked his tongue clearly across the radio. Okay, hang tight. I'll finish what you started. They're all yours, detective, Trenton replied, and slid down the door to sit on the floor. Reed sank down next to him, rubbing his shoulders with a groan. 
There'd better be some ibuprofen and icy hot in his bag. Pretty sure the stuff in his bag will make ibuprofen look like candy, his friend said. Reed barked a laugh. In that case, I might need two days off, one to heal up and one to recover from healing. Trenton chuckled and then flinched at the sound of gunfire in the hallway. After the first shot, they listened as the thumping on the door ceased and a steady stream of bullets cracked through the air. Thirty seconds later, the air was quiet. There were no moans, not bullets, not a single sound. They both jumped at the sound of a playful rat-a-tat-tat on the door. Guessing we're not lucky enough to get pizza delivery, Reed said. Trenton hopped to his feet and held out a hand for his sore friend. They opened the door and Roger stood there, holding his rifle to his lips to playfully blow on it like an old-timey cowboy. Y'all miss me? he asked with a smirk. Trenton rolled his eyes. You got the goods? Bags are by the stairwell door, Rogers replied, inclining his head. The younger man nodded. We'll grab them and come on, because we're not out of this yet. Chapter 13 Rogers led their trio out of the hospital, the duffel bag loaded to the max with drugs, and slung comfortably over his shoulder. With his free hand, he held Reed's assault rifle, having lost his own, and the younger man not as accurate with it as the detective. Leon, you copy? Rogers asked into his walkie-talkie as they moved at a brisk pace. He came back almost immediately. Yes, sir, you boys clear? Clear of the hospital, at least, the detective replied. Leon sighed audibly through the radio. Well, don't waste time chatting me up. I got a firing squad at the barricade in case you bring some up with you but that doesn't do us any good if they beat you to the cutoff. Copy that, Rogers promised. We'll let you know when we're past the warehouse. Be safe, brother, Leon said. The detective put his walkie-talkie back on his belt and picked up the pace to a light jog. He knew that with the heavy goods, he wouldn't be able to sprint for long, and they needed enough gumption to make it back to town. We'd better start hoofing it, he huffed as the boys kept up. Fighting zombies is bad enough, but I get the sense listening to Leon tell us how right he was would be the salt in the wound. They turned at the road and headed towards their destination and stopped short at the sight of a horde standing in front of the warehouse, taking up most of the road. Fuck, now what? Reed asked, scratching the back of his head. Rogers took a deep breath and spoke quickly and sternly. Reed, you focus on getting that fire started. Trenton, you find out where those fuckers are getting out and I'll take the stragglers, go. Without hesitation, the trio split and rushed into the fray. Some of the zombies on the road turned to face them, mouths opening in hunger, but Rogers began popping off rounds, dropping them easily. Trenton tore across the warehouse grounds, leaping over the buckled fence as a dozen or so creatures converged on his position. He ducked under a set of rotted arms, grabbing a soft wrist and spinning the zombie back to send it flying back into its friends. He looked up and noticed a broken chute on the side wall, mentally cursing their negligence as a zombie approached it, falling over the waist-high exit and tumbling down the slide. It landed on its face, but stumbled to its feet to join the horde. Trenton glanced over his shoulder to see Rogers mowing down the rest he'd knocked over behind him. He grabbed the staggering zombie and smacked it forcefully in the shoulder, spinning it 180 degrees so that its back was to him. He gave it a shove, jamming it into the makeshift exit, clogging it up. Gnarled hands tried to reach around the grunting body, but the creature was large enough to stuff the hole fairly well. You good back there? Rogers asked, leaning around the building. Trenton nodded, chest heaving. Yeah, got the hole plugged, just waiting on Reed to fire it up. Hang tight, Rogers replied, and ran back out to the road, taking out the last few stragglers out front. He calmly loaded a fresh mag as he stared at the approaching horde, about 40 yards from the turnoff road. He aimed and carefully fired, taking several of the lead zombies in the head, briefly slowing the tide of rotting flesh as they tripped over each other. Lighting the fire now, Reed screamed from the distance, and the detective tore back to where Trenton had a watchful eye on the plugged hole. The fire sparked, and then the fuel ignited engulfing the entire front of the building into flames. Reed came around the corner, almost barreling into Rogers. Come on, we gotta go out through the back, the detective instructed, 
and then turned to Trenton, who was holding the stopper zombie in place. Pop that motherfucker, we gotta move. He nodded and used his handgun to still the flailing creature, and it slumped, thankfully, in the right angle to continue to plug the opening. The trio tore down the side of the building, getting to the back and cutting through the overgrown shortcut they'd mapped before to get back to the main road. When they got to the bushes on the side, Rogers flung out his hands to stop the boys, peeking his head out to survey the horde that was no more than 50 yards away. Okay, he said quietly, ducking back down to face them. Looks like the fire is attracting them, so let's not give them anything else to care about. Follow me and stay low. Trenton and Reed nodded in agreement and moved through the brush, crouched as low as they could go. Rogers led them past a vacant lot and then took a hard turn when they hit a yard. They rushed up to the house and pressed up against the back of it, carefully peeking around the back corner. Y'all stay out of sight. Rogers whispered, I'm gonna check the road. He stayed low and slithered his way towards the front yard, putting himself in position to look out. He let out a deep sigh of relief at the sight of zero zombies and jogged back to the house. Well, Reed asked. Rogers grinned. Holy shit, I think that worked. Just to be safe, though, I think we should stick to backyards for a few blocks, Trenton suggested. The detective nodded. Agreed, let's get a move on. Chapter 14 Leon knelt down against a car being used as a makeshift barrier, glancing worriedly at the men around him. Most of them looked like they'd never even held a weapon, let alone shot one, which worried him on too many levels. Firstly, that he had shitty backup, but secondly, that if a horde followed Roger's back, the lives of everyone in town were likely screwed. I see movement, one of the guards cried, and Leon sprung up to look. Three figures jogged up the middle of the road. Leon held up a hand. Nobody fires until I do. His brow furrowed. Is everybody clear on that? He boomed, and the men all muttered in the affirmative. He aimed his sniper rifle downrange and checked his scope. His heart leapt when he realized it was Rogers, Reed, and Trenton. The detective raised his arms and waved them wildly before cupping his hands around his mouth. Don't shoot, he yelled. We brought drugs. Leon dissolved into laughter, and the men around him seemed to visibly relax. It's a good thing our enemies never learned that line, because I'm pretty sure that shit would have worked, he joked and hopped the barricade. As they finally stood in front of each other and exchanged a fist bump, he smirked at the detective. So you brought drugs, huh? Yep, Rogers replied. I have no clue what any of them do, but there's a shitload of them. Leon grinned. Hopefully the nurse knows a thing or two about them. Clara make it back yet? Trenton asked, brows knit with worry. Leon shook his head. Not yet, but that's not surprising. Even if she drove straight there and back, she wouldn't be due for another half hour. Trenton nodded stiffly, taking the answer in stride. Leon looked at his watch and paused for a moment, putting a finger to his lips. Got somewhere to be? Rogers asked, a hint of amusement in his tone. As a matter of fact, I do, his friend replied. Next satellite flyover is in about 45 minutes, so we should get those drugs inspected and get to the command center. The detective tossed the duffel bag to Leon, who caught it with a grunt. Lead the way, big fella, Rogers declared with a grin. Leon shook his head. Oh, is this how it's gonna be then? Benefits of being the leader, get to delegate, the detective replied. His friend barked a laugh. Shit, if I knew you were gonna be delegating me to be your pack mule, I would've left you out there. They shared a laugh as they hopped back over the barricade. Trenton and Reed busied themselves loading up a waiting vehicle as the older men turned to the group of wide-eyed men still manning the area. Guys, I think we shook the horde, but in case we didn't, I need you all to hang tight a little longer, Rogers said, holding out his hands. Leon nodded. And just so we're clear, nobody shoots until I do he repeated. So if you see more than two zombies headed this way, then you radio me. Everybody got that? There was a chorus of affirmative noises. All right, you boys got this, Leon declared. We'll get back to you soon. He and Rogers hopped into the waiting vehicle, and Trenton started the engine. The detective stared out the window, collecting his racing mind. It had been a rough day, 
one he knew he was lucky to have survived. Being on this side of it, alive, was surreal. Chapter 15 Leon typed away on the satellite computer as the town nurse rifled through the duffel bag on the table next to him. Detective, was there any rhyme or reason to your selections here? She asked, sounding a little exasperated as she tried to sort through it all. Roger shrugged. I started with the biggest containers, then went with the longest names. Figured the more syllables, the more it did. I'm beginning to see why you didn't become a doctor, Leon declared brightly, not even looking up from his work. The nurse sighed. I second that. Shit, did I not get anything usable? Rogers asked, the color draining from his face. She pointed to the different piles as she explained. These are good, high-end painkillers. These will be good at treating various infections and illnesses. These, however, are used to treat thyroids, which will be awesome for the handful of women in the camp that need this, but I doubt Senor Rivas is going to care about it. So we have what? Rogers began as he leaned over the table. Half a dozen drugs that can get them high? She let out a deep breath, puffing out her cheeks. There may be some more in here, as I'm still going through the bag, but that's all I have so far. The detective chewed his lip, afraid that the entire operation was a total bust. I know it's a little late in the day for coffee, Ethel announced, as she appeared with two steaming mugs. So I made it decaf. Roger smiled warmly at her. Mighty nice of you, Ethel. He accepted a mug and took a deep whiff of it, savoring the earthy scent. Should be coming online any minute now, Leon said, and leaned back to accept his mug, giving Ethel a nod of thanks. Trenton and Reed entered the room, sidling up next to the detective. They all leaned in to get a good look at the monitor as Leon honed in on Fabens. He first checked on the warehouse, which was still smoldering. Looks like the fire took root, he said and scanned the surrounding area. And it doesn't look like any of them wandered up towards the barricade. Roger squinted. But where did that horde go that was coming from the school? Maybe they burned up? Reed asked hopefully. Trenton shook his head. Nah, we'd see bodies on the ground if that were the case. Leon moved the camera around, and finally managed to find the mass of shambling bodies heading back towards the school. What the hell? Why are they going back? Maybe a bird attracted them, and they all just played follow the leader? Reed asked. Rogers pursed his lips. Yeah, maybe, he admitted, but didn't sound convinced. That would have to be one hell of a loud bird, though. Leon zoomed out a bit to look at the entirety of the horde, looking as large as ever. It was a veritable sea of creatures, covering the entire grounds of the school. Man, I just don't get it, Trenton sighed. What's keeping them there? Like when we were in Van Horn, those things were spread out all over the place, not congregating together. Roger squinted at the screen, and as Leon began punching keys to move the camera, he put a hand on his shoulder. Wait, wait, he urged. Leon waved his hand at the monitor. I'm screen capturing this so we can look at it later. We don't have a long window of time here. Look at the top of the school, Rogers demanded. They all leaned forward with bated breath. Leon's jaw dropped. Son of a bitch. He furiously typed away at the keyboard, zooming in closer on the roof. There were two people there, clear as day, appearing to be hanging what looked like a banner off of the side of the building. How in the fuck did we miss them? Trenton threw his hands up. Rogers rubbed his hand over his mouth, squeezing his chin. Guess they got trapped in the high school and didn't want to risk making a run for it. If the building is secure, it's not a bad idea, Leon admitted. That cafeteria should be stocked, even if it is school food. Reed drew in a sharp breath. The bigger question is, how in the hell are we getting to them? Rodriguez says he's going to try and get us more ammo in the next day or two, so that'll help, Leon replied. In the meantime, I need to do some more scans before we lose the set. Rogers nodded, patting his friend on the shoulder. Do what you gotta do. We'll start game planning the school. He motioned for the boys to follow him, leaving Leon to focus on what he needed to do with the satellite. Guess the sight of those survivors riled up the horde, huh? Reed mused. Trenton nodded. That explains why the breakaway group started heading back. It makes sense, but it also makes our job harder, 
Roger said, leaning back against a table to take a sip of his coffee. We've got to figure out how to get into contact with them. Trenton shrugged. I think the first step is going to see what their banner says. For the moment, let's assume it says that they're alive, the detective suggested. They probably heard Leon's gunshots and saw the smoke from the fire we started, so they wanted to let us know they were there. Reed raised an eyebrow. Can we make our own banner and hang it up? Unless they have binoculars, they wouldn't be able to see it, Trenton replied, shaking his head. No way we'd get close enough. His friend grinned. We could get a water balloon launcher and send them a message in a bottle. Trenton and Rogers blinked at him, not saying a word. What? he asked, putting up his hands, palms out. I'm trying to think outside the box here. Try harder, Trenton replied dryly. You know, Ethel spoke up as she approached with a fresh pot of coffee. My grandson has one of them flying contraptions. I can't remember the word, um, but it's got them helicopter blades all over it. Rogers brightened. A drone? Yeah, I think that's it, she replied, and refilled his mug. The detective nodded his thanks. Do you think your grandson would let us borrow it? Sure, she replied. I mean, it's not doing him any good right now anyway, because he doesn't have any power to charge it. Rogers turned to call over his shoulder. Hey, Leon, do you think we can borrow your solar panel charger for a while? Shouldn't be a problem, came the monotone reply, and he didn't even look away from his screen. We'll get it set up in the morning. Perfect, Rogers replied, turning back to the helpful elderly woman. In the meantime, Ethel, would you mind bringing it over here? We need to figure out a way to secure a walkie-talkie to it. If you don't mind handling your own refills, I'll go get it right now, she replied with a kind smile. Rogers took the pot from her and handed it immediately to Reed. I think we can manage, thank you so much. My pleasure, hon, she said, and headed for the door. She stopped just short of it and snapped her fingers, turning back. Oh, by the way, detective, that nice young lady just came back. Trenton breathed an audible sigh of relief, and his eyes lit up as Clara opened the door and strolled in. Ethel patted her on the shoulder and disappeared, leaving them to it. Welcome back. Everything go well? Trenton said, setting his empty mug in front of Reed, who wrinkled his nose as he filled it up, sloshing a little on the table. Clara shrugged. I didn't get shot or bitten, and I came back with a bottle. She set her high-end bottle of tequila in front of them. With the way this week is going, we'll chalk that up as a victory, Leon declared from his seat. She looked up at the detective. Did you guys get the drugs? Cutting right to the chase, Rogers replied, an amused glint in his eye. Clara noticed the nurse sorting through a table full of bottles and headed right up to her. I need you to find me something to treat an infection. What kind, the nurse replied, pausing to address the woman that had sidled up very close to her. Don't know, Clara admitted, but it's from a bullet wound. The nurse pursed her lips. Give me a minute and I'll see what I can do. The young woman nodded and turned back around to her comrades. Who got shot? Trenton asked, trying to sound casual. One of our new friends who gave us that bottle, Clara explained, motioning to the tequila. They have a case of that stuff that they're willing to part with if I can bring back something to help their friend. There was a pregnant silence as everyone processed that information. It was Leon who broke the silence. El Guapo wants booze more than drugs, so I say make the trade. I think he's right, Rogers added. Take whatever you need to take and make the trade tomorrow. The case will get us through a couple of weeks with the cartel. Trenton raised an eyebrow. I don't suppose they were up for joining us, were they? He asked. Because we could really use some more manpower. They said they'd think about it, which was good enough for me, Clara replied. Taking this back tomorrow isn't going to hurt, though. They sure would be an asset here. She glanced over at the monitor and stepped up behind Leon. Can you pull up Fort Davis? He punched a few keys and the camera repositioned. What am I looking for? Close-up shots, she instructed. We need to see if there is a group there, and if there is, how defended they look. Leon furrowed his brow as he worked. I know I'm not the best at directions, but how the hell did you end up near Fort Davis? 
Ran into a group of them in Marfa, and they were not too friendly, Clara explained with a shudder. Leon gazed up at her. How bad? They crucified a couple of cartel guys, she said. Literally crucified, with railroad spikes. She poked her palm with her index finger to accentuate her point. So bad, Leon replied, and took a deep breath as he zoomed in on the fort. There were rudimentary fortifications and several people milling about, but then the screen began to go dark. Damn it, satellite is out of range. Next time it comes up, though, I'm honing in on them first. If they are crucifying people, we need to keep an eye on them. Cartel to one side, pissed off Roman cosplayers on the other, Rogers muttered. Trenton sighed, and a shitload of zombies in between. Life is good, huh? Reed said brightly, and everyone chuckled, diffusing the tension to avoid breaking down from the stress. I don't know about anybody else, Trenton declared, but I need a change of clothes and some food. Reed raised his hands into the air. Here, here. I gotta add a nap in there, too, Clara said. Gonna have to take off early to make it back to the other group. The nurse waved at her. I'll pack a bag with the drugs you need and some notes on how to use them. Thank you, I really appreciate it, Clara replied, and the trio headed for the door. Hey, Roger said, stopping them. Y'all did a hell of a job today. If you can keep it up, we might actually get through this in one piece. He offered a sincere smile. Trenton returned it warmly. Thanks, detective. We'll see you in the morning. They all exchanged goodbyes, and the three young soldiers of the apocalypse departed. Nurse, can you give us a few minutes, please? Rogers asked gently. I need to discuss something with Leon. She nodded. Of course, detective. She grabbed her empty mug and the still half-full pot of coffee and headed in the direction of the kitchen. Leon swiveled in his chair, crossing his arms. What's on your mind, my friend? We need to do something about the cartel, Rogers said firmly. His partner barked a laugh. Man, I wasn't aware that Captain Obvious got demoted to detective. I'm being serious, Rogers furrowed his brow. Oh, I know, Leon replied. That's why I'm laughing. And look at what we've got at our disposal. It's me, you, and three college kids. That's not exactly a formidable force against a fucking army. Rogers nodded. I agree, we're not ready yet, but we've got potential. He straightened his shoulders. If we can get to those people in the school and get Clara's friends here, that'll bump up our numbers. Did you miss the part about them having an army? Leon demanded, eyebrows rising to his hairline. We don't have to take them all out, just sever the head, Rogers said, holding up his hands. Rodriguez is second in command, after all. Leon sucked in a breath, nodding slowly. So if El Guapo goes down, the cartel goes from adversary to ally real quick. Okay, I'm tracking now. As long as we keep the new recruits hidden from view, they'll never know what hit them. The detective continued, voice rising in excitement. Leon turned back to the keyboard, bringing up a schedule. I'll tell you what, I'm supposed to talk to my military buddies tomorrow. You know, the ones who said fuck it and went to New Mexico? I'll feel them out, see if they're interested in helping. If we can get them on board, we just might have a chance, Rogers mused. Leon nodded. Yeah, then all we have to do is figure out how to assassinate the head of the most powerful cartel while he's surrounded by guards, all while not being detected, because even if Rodriguez takes charge, he'd have to make an example out of us to retain power. See, nothing to it, Rogers replied with a lopsided grin. Leon reached out and grabbed his friend's mug of coffee, taking a deep whiff of it and then held it out. Just making sure the shit wasn't Irish. Rogers laughed and took the mug back, downing the rest of it in a deep gulp. He pulled a flask from his inside jacket pocket and dumped a generous amount into the empty cup before offering the metal receptacle to his friend. Leon graciously accepted it, taking a swig. First things first, though, Rogers said, smacking his lips. We've gotta figure out how to get those people out of the school. You get more coffee, and I'll pull up the map, Leon declared, and turned back to his keyboard. Should I brew us up some regular? The detective asked. His friend chuckled. Unless you think we can come up with a plan to wipe out a few thousand zombies in the next 15 minutes or so. Regular it is, Rogers replied, 
and toasted him with the last sip of burning liquid from his mug. As he headed off to make a fresh pot, he blinked back the exhaustion behind his eyes, ready for what was sure to be yet another long planning session. End of Book 8 Up next, the action shifts to New Mexico as Leon's military friends deal with an explosive situation they inadvertently triggered.